Hans, you were at the very beginning of developing of this document. Uh, what were the ideas that gave birth to this? Um, it was prompted by our member churches, particularly in India, uh, saying that they um, uh, wanted us to do something to improve relations between Hindus and Christians in India because some Christian groups um, were understood by Hindus, Hindu activists, to be disregarding Hindu integrity, uh, were um, discarding Hinduism as a living religious tradition, and so on. And that this created some tensions between Indian Christians and Hindus, because Hindus could not be expected to make a difference between this Christian or that Christian. So there were. So they saw all Christians as the same. Exactly. So, like we see all Muslims as same. Exactly. So stereotyping uh, is um, everywhere. And so we were asked could we not try to have in India, for instance, a meeting where we tried to make Christians formulate some kind of code of conduct on what to do and what not to do so that Hindus could hear about the respect that Hindu, uh, Indian Christians had for Hindus and for Muslims and for people of other faiths and that they would not uh, impose their religion but kind of wanted to serve in as humble way, a way as possible. But I hear sometimes people of other faith say because we witness of the gospel that's a violation of their own religious sensibilities. How do we speak of Christ without violating people's sense of their own religion? This is, it's not so easy to say in a short, in a short way, but I think that we as Christians, and actually whatever religion we are of, when we want to share our faith, our, we need to uh, make sure that we are not putting all our weight on the message, but also on the receiver. And um, the one who is to receive the message is as important as the message, because the message is, after all, for the, the one who is to receive it. So uh, the respect for the other, the imitatio Christi, in uh, relating to the other. That means in English? Uh, that means the imitation of Christ, of following Christ, not only by, uh, not only if Christ ever did so, preaching, but in walking the way of Christ in our preaching. So this document really is about living the life as Jesus lived. Yes, more and more I think that we uh, need to uh, dress ourselves in Christ, as it were, in our relations with people of other faiths. Now, was there ever a danger, as you worked in developing this, that what the three groups would do is kind of collapse to the lowest common denominator as a way of getting consensus and agreement? I think there is a risk of this, but what was then so good is that we managed to bring, so to say, a third party into it. Because, after all, the mainline churches constituting the World Council of Churches and the Roman Catholic Church have so much in common in terms of having worked together more or less intimately that it would be uh, more easy there to kind of formulate a document which um, uh, maybe wouldn't be so poignant when we invited a third party, I would say evangelicals and Pentecostals. Did it mess things up? Messed things up in a good way because we were now interacting with people who by some were considered to be the, the villain in this. They were the ones who uh, kind of uh, uh, had led to these deteriorating relations between Christians and Hindus in India. And on the other hand, who maybe were stronger in pointing to that faith cannot only be uh, said in slogans about justice, about peace, about 
uh, this or that, but had also to do with my own integrity as a human being and a disciple of Christ by inviting the Costals and, um, and evangelicals, I think we complicated the conversation towards a document where we were suddenly not eager to find the common, least common denominator, but eager to listen to what are the concerns that Pentecostals and evangelicals or Catholics or Methodists are carrying forth here? What is it that, that really brings them to this table? And in that, a conversation can emerge that would lead us to formulate new ways and new, yeah, new ways of expressing what is important, where are the do's and where are the don'ts, what can we do, what can we not do, where do we need to repent, what does aid evangelism mean, are we or have we been found guilty of kind of putting uh, the message above the one who is to receive it so that we disregarded the needs, plight of the one to receive it. So as the, as the in a sense, the father of the idea that brought it into discussion and today it's, it's being launched. How do you feel? I think it's a good way of seeing that maybe we didn't arrive at kind of a decalogue of this we have done and we realize this. This we will do and we commit ourselves to it. This we won't do and we commit ourselves even stronger to this. Maybe we didn't arrive at that yet, but at least I am glad that, for, I don't know for the first time in history, maybe not, but at least it's not that often that Christians representing the bulk of Christianity come together on such a controversial issue as conversion and find ways of expressing themselves towards, I hope, when it's appropriated in Christian communities, there may be a development towards much more of what I intended from the beginning. Thank you.